College and then uh, LA, uh, one of the LA. LA Mission. LA Mission. Yes. Uh -oh. So she's very talented. Her daughter's giving me the situation report on how talented. And uh, so we're going to let Ethel take this away and welcome everybody. Yes. And thank you, Ethel. Thank you. Thank you all. And I'm glad to be here today. Yes. And see so many of my familiar faces and neighbors and even Boomer. I love the audience. <laughs> yes, today I'm going to talk about uh, how the artist, how, the, how art has changed over the centuries. And I hope it will give you a better understanding of art. Uh, in order to understand the art of today, we really have to look back in, and understand the art of the past. And that's what we're going to try by seeing some slides, some pictures of um, the art of the past, and I'll try to explain how the artist felt and why, why he painted the way he did. Artists always react to their environment. I mean, they have to. After all, their environment is uh, the people who pay them. <laughs> and uh, the reason they're painting, they're creative, they're creative. And they don't always paint what the, the uh, environment wants. They, because they're creative, they're constantly creating something new, as you'll see. Patrick, next. Oh, this, this slide, the first one, if you can go back, Patrick. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. The, this is from the cave paintings. And the earliest paintings we knew were done by the cave artists. Now, the reason they did pictures of animals, these look like deer or something like that, and the deer have arrows going into them. They're, they're looking for success in the hunt, and you wonder why that is. Actually, these paintings weren't done uh, as decorations for the rooms they lived in. No, these were done in secret caves way in the back. Only the shaman or the priests were allowed in there to paint and to look at them. But once in a while, they'd have a, um, a session where all of the public could come in. And because they were there, they had to sign their names. At that time, of course, nobody could write, read or write. So Patrick, next slide. They signed their names by putting their hand on the, on the wall and blowing paint around their hands through a hollow reed. Yes, the cave painters. The earliest form of painting. Next slide, Patrick. We're going to jump ahead. Can you make that bigger? Good. To Peter Bruegel. Peter Bruegel, uh, or Hieronymus Bosch, I'm sorry. Hieronymus Bosch. He painted a triptych. A triptych is a three piece altarpiece. And uh, one of the parts was a garden of earthly delights. That's what this is the garden of earthly delights. And then the Garden of Hell and the Garden of Heaven. And uh, of course, in these days, early 14th century, life was pretty dull. No TV, no radio, nothing. People were really drawn to the church. I mean, they would come in throngs just to see these paintings and to, to think about what's going on here and to get these ulterior... Next slide, please. Yeah, and here's a, a close-up of the Garden of Hell. <laughs> it's a triptych. You know, some of the unearthly things that are happening. My God, look at the uh, little demon in the lower right-hand corner. He's eating a, a person. So people were drawn to the church. They'd come in droves just to see these paintings. 14th century. All right, next slide. This is Hieronymus Bosch. Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, was a great painter. He did. This is a landscape seascape that he did. Very common. Now the uh, patrons of art were changing. Instead of being just the church, had all the money when all the previous painters were there. But now this painter, he got paid by wealthy guilds. A guild at that time was sort of like a union, like a union. Next slide, Patrick. And, and here's a close-up of one of his paintings done, by, paid for by the guilds, the angels. But of course, these were very stylized. The painter responded to his patron, the person who was painting him, and things were very, very um, 
definitely stated you had to do it a certain way, and they were very stiff and formal. Next slide, Patrick. Peter Bruegel, the elder. This is, oh, this is Jan Van Eck. Oh, I love this painting. It's an interesting painting. It's the marriage. Instead of getting a marriage certificate, you got to, if you have the money, you got a painter to paint a picture of you and your wife. And this was the, the statement that said you were married. This was for, and it looks like by the state of her belly that they, they just, they did it just in time. It looks like it. Yes, Hieronymus Bosch. <laughs> okay. Oh, Peter Bruegel. Peter Bru oh, oh no, this is still, this is Giotto. I'm sorry, Giotto, my favorite painter. I love Giotto above all the others. He broke away from the stylized, stylized, uh, de dedicated, uh, dictated by the sponsors uh, way of painting, and he did his own thing. He put emotion into his paintings. But uh, an odd thing happens. Look closely at the two faces. It's two of the apostles kissing, but a uh, greeting. But all of a sudden, when you look at it carefully, the two faces become one. It's called an equivocal contour. The two faces melt. Faces they melt into one. Do you see that? Yeah. All of you. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Giotto, my favorite. This is just a, a little portion of one of Giotto's paintings. Notice the angels have a lot of emotion. This wasn't allowed before. You weren't allowed to show emotion. You had to do things the way the church wanted it done. Show the whole, one, next slide, please, the whole painting. This is the whole painting with the little angels ho hovering overhead the death of Christ and the beautiful little angels. I mean, they're in anguish. They're crying. And you weren't allowed to show emotion, but all of a sudden, Giotto does. He's really my favorite painter, I guess, down through the ages. Uh, when I went to Europe, I did get to see his paintings. You had to uh, be very careful and had to wear certain clothes to be able to go into this church because they were trying to preserve the atmosphere so the paintings wouldn't get uh, aged. Next slide, please. Uh, we all know Michelangelo. Michelangelo and a ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Yes. And the, and the centerpiece is God creating Adam. Of course, these were all ideas, and again, the people thronged to the church because this, these things were wonderful to see, and life outside was not so pleasant. Nothing, uh, nothing really wonderful. No TV, no radio, no nothing. You came to church to see these beautiful paintings. Michelangelo actually construct, had a scaffolding constructed right below the ceiling, and he laid down on the scaffolding, and, and the paint would be dripping into his eyes, but he, he did paint. By the way, I forgot to tell you that Peter Bruegel was accredited with inventing oil paint. And uh, yeah, oil paint is still around nowadays, but uh, they say it lasts only perhaps a couple hundred years, and then what we're looking at today is not the original. It's been touched up and touched up very, very carefully but uh, it only lasts about 200 years. Now we're using a new kind of paint, uh, acrylic, plastic paint, and we don't know, we don't know how long that's gonna last. <laughs> we're hoping it's gonna last longer. Ah, uh, Jan Van Eck. Oh, no, I'm sorry, this is Vermeer. Girl with a pearl earring, yes. Vermeer, V-E-R-M-E-E-R. -E -E and he was a fantastic painter. Only 35 paintings of his exist nowadays. I don't know why, because he was a prolific painter, but only 35 exist. And uh, this is what he was highly criticized at the time by his fellow uh, artists, because a new, a new thing had come into being, and it was called the camera obscura. It was the, the beginning stages of the camera. And of course, the camera changed everything for the artist. And when we finish this whole slide presentation, 
I'm going to tell you how, how it really has changed. But the camera really has changed. Next slide, please. This is another Vermeer, and uh, it's called The Milkmaid. And even though he was so criticized for using the camera obscura to throw the picture onto his canvas or onto his board, they used a board in those days, um, later on, we generations later, we really lauded him for his handling and his portrayal of atmosphere. You see the atmosphere around this painting. And they gave it a term, they called it sfumato, sfumato, which means um, uh, handling of atmosphere, sfumato, S-F-U-M-A-T-O. Next slide, please. Uh, Rembrandt. Rembrandt, as a young man, I'm sorry, I only have two slides of Rembrandt, but two portraits as a young man. And of course, he was very prolific, very, very prolific. Many, and as an old man, interesting to see how the face has changed down through the ages, a young man and an old man. All right, next slide, please. Da Vinci. Uh, nope. Oh, no, this is still Rembrandt, I'm sorry, Rembrandt. And his, one of his most famous paintings was paid for by a guild, a, a union, and it's called the Night Watch. The Night Watch was a group of men who got together and walked the streets every night to keep the peace. They were the policemen. The, they were pre precursing the policemen of the present day, the Night Watch. And they really wanted a portrait. Each person here paid an equal amount of money to the painter, to Rembrandt, to paint this. And But they argued, they said, why is his painting in the front so large and mine is so small? And they all argued, who is the little girl in the lower right, left-hand corner there? Who is the little girl? She didn't pay anything. But the artist, of course, needed, needed this totality for his expression, his creative expression, was very important. All right, the next slide. Uh, we, we know this, don't we? We, know, we all know the Mona Lisa. I was so disappointed when I went to Europe and saw this painting. It's very small, only 12 by, say, 18, very small. And uh, her smile, no eyebrows. Did you notice that, ladies, no eyebrows? That was the style at the time, no eyebrows. And, and her smile, it's called an enigmatic smile. It, it doesn't really mean anything. Is she scowling? Is she smirking? Or is she really smiling? But it has become, of course, Leonardo da Vinci. Very, very important. All right. Next, next slide, please. Ah, uh, Monet. Monet. He, 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 he did a very famous painting, which I was privileged to see when I went to Europe. You can walk into a room and you're surrounded on three sides with water lilies. You're in a garden. You're in a garden. You walk, it's a rather small room. You walk into this garden of water lilies. A painting envelops you. It's marvelous. It's just marvelous, his water lilies. And he was called an impressionist. Impressionism was a very, very, oh, the art school at the time really objected to them. They didn't like them at all. They said, oh, what are they doing? They're not doing this right. They're not correct. And they kicked them out of the art school at the, school at the time. They had a terrible time being accepted because they used a short, choppy brush stroke and your eye had to mix the color. If you walked up close to this painting, you wouldn't see anything. You'd just see swabs of paint. But if you stood 10 feet away, you could see green and blue and yellow. And the eye would mix the color. The artist would put a, a little swatch of blue and a swatch of yellow next to each other. And at 10 feet away, you'd mix the color and it would appear green. <laughs> so this artist, what they were trying to achieve was light. The artist was always creative. They were trying to achieve light as it hit an object. And they, they succeeded. You see the light reflecting off of the water in the center. 
they were really a success and we ages later we we lobbed them we really yes we we really lobbed them and we really uh, are grateful for the impressionists uh, an artist next slide please art is always creative you know and Seurat, S-E-R-A-U-T, Seurat decided he was going to be more creative and he was going to do one better. Instead of using a swatch of paint next to one another, he was going to use a tiny dot. And he used tiny dots of paint. And uh, his paintings all of a sudden didn't move. They, they appear like a stopped time. They're, they're not impressionism anymore they're they're different they're they're a stop time he got something that he hadn't counted on this is called the garden the garden and and it's really interesting you can see that this took an awfully long time to paint because the artist was putting a little tiny dot of blue next to yellow and your eye would mix the green but he was trying to be impressionistic but he wasn't <laughs> All right, next slide, please. Yes, oh, we all know, yes. Yes, um, Van Gogh. Van Gogh as a young man, and of course he was a very troubled person. He couldn't, he couldn't uh, bring himself to comply with the art of the time. He couldn't bring himself to do Impressionism, although they all were. Instead, he used swirling bits of paint, swirling bits of paint, and we call his, you see even the paint in the bodice of the, the uh, uh, jacket there, it's swirling, his paint moves. He, he did something we called expressionism, expressionism, Van Gogh, yes. Next slide please, Patrick. Uh, the screen, now this is true expressionism. I mean, look at the paint. The paint is swirling. It's moving. It's just, it's just moving all over the place. It makes you feel emotional, and you feel the scream, the scream. It, it's really just a very, very, you know, the artist is M-U-N-C-H, uh, Munch, Edward Munch, and uh, the scream. But it's a very famous painting because you can feel the scream. The artist has definitely succeeded in what he was trying to create. He was trying to create Impressionism, but he did his own thing. It was ex Expressionism, they call it. They named it. Next slide, please, Patrick. Ah, uh, yes. And who is this you all know? This is the Ger Guernicaia. It's a protest against war. A protest against war, yeah, by... Salva by um, yeah, this one was by Pablo Picasso. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Picasso, yes. And you notice he's doing his own thing also. He's doing something that is brand new. It's called cubism. Cubism. He reduces everything to a, a geometric shape, a cube or a, a panel or a, a triangle. But it does express the horrors of war. Notice the horse in the left middle. He, he's screaming. And, and the uh, oxen at the very left. And the woman screaming the horrors of war, the awful, awful things that happen in war. And he was protesting war with the Guernicaia. Yes. And uh, next slide. Uh, Salvador Dali. Dali. Dolly doing his own thing again. The artist, you can't stop him. The artist does his own thing always. And this is called surrealism. Surrealism, which means a very realistic thing, the watch, seen in an unreal manner. The watch is melting. Watches don't do that. But that's Salvador Dolly in surrealism. He, he uh, really succeeded and became a great success. Uh, you might not like his work. You might not say it's beautiful or I like it, it's pleasing. It isn't pleasing because it's done in an unreal manner. Unreal. It's, it's hard to accept the things that are happening. Watches don't melt. But uh, he, he sees it as, as such. 
through his surrealistic method of painting. And he made his statement, as the artist always does. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, Andy Warhol. This is ugly. It's really ugly, but it, it's, uh, it's an expression of what was seen in the early 20th century. In the early 20th century, all of a sudden, we had canned food, and you saw it everywhere. And Andy Warhol, he was trying to express something new, something that was seen on the everyday scene. And the artist often does that. He takes the things around him and tries to react to it. Campbell's soup. He has another painting of all oh, a whole shelf full of Campbell's soup cans. Very ugly, and I don't know if you'd want to hang it in your living room, but it's it's what happened at the time. It's a true expression of the early 20th century. Yes. Next slide, please. Ah, uh, larger. Mm -hmm. Franz Klein. I love his work. I think there's something strong. This is called the bridge. And if I had a picture of the bridge to show you alongside of it, it is the bridge. It's, it's exactly as the bridge is. It's strong and bold and iron and steel. And this is the way he expressed it. Actually, to me, it's very beautiful because it's so strong and it's so expressive of the bridge. The bridge. That's the last of my slides that I'm going to show you. And I was going to say that you can stop if you want, but anyway, um, the artist always reacts to his environment. He does. He's a reaction to his environment. Who knows what the art of today will come up with? We have all sorts of new works, new kinds of art. And I wouldn't be surprised if Judy here, an artist, a fine artist, comes up with something fantastic, and we'll know her down through history. Um, you all still like realism. Realism is great. And all realism takes is for the artist to be very, very clever with eye-hand coordination. The eye looks at something, and the hand works to put it down there. But not everybody can do that. Maybe you can't. But I, I'm going to tell you a secret. Today you can. You have to take the camera. The camera made a big impression on the artist. You have to take the camera, take a picture of something, and various art stores will take that picture and superimpose it on a canvas of your choice, and all you have to do is color it in. Any one of you today can be an artist. Any one of you. All you have to do, again, is take a camera, take a picture of something, have it superimposed on a canvas, and paint it in. Note the big emphasis today on coloring books. All of a sudden, they're saying that's very good for you psychologically. It's very, very uh, relaxing and wonderful. But any one of you, now, I want you all to try it. Take a picture of something, take it to an art store and have them superimpose it on a canvas. You paint it in, and you're an artist. So realism, realism isn't really creative anymore although it may be a beginning. When you're painting that picture, you may get inspired and you may go on to other things. It may be a first footstep into art for you. Um, I wanted to show you, now there are two terms nowadays called abstract art and non-objective art. And sometimes they look the same. I brought in two pieces of mine. This is, this is an abstract. Sorry, it's so small. I couldn't put the big ones in the car. But this is an abstract because I began with butterflies. You don't see them anymore. And what I did was do a sketch of the butterflies, and then I did another sketch from that sketch, and a sketch from that sketch, four sketches down, I ended up with this. And these are butterflies. So this is called an abstract. To abstract means to take from. The word ab and stract. Stract is from, ab to take, to take from. So I took from the butterflies and I abstracted them. Sometimes you, the viewer, have to ask the artist. And you say, well, what is that? Is this an abstract or is this a non-objective painting? 
This is a non-objective painting, which means I began with nothing. I began with nothing. I didn't begin with any subject matter. And I just painted. I just painted and used what I feel as design and um, uh, color and line, line, form, design, and color. Those are the four aspects of art that are important. And I used those things to paint. I didn't begin with anything. Now, when you look at the, uh, the butterflies and the abstract, I mean, the, the abstract butterflies and the non-objective, they look the same. You couldn't tell. What are, you have to ask the artist, what is that? <laughs> is that an abstract or is it? So anyway, you all learned something new today. You all could be an artist if you want to. And who knows, it might be your first step towards becoming a real artist. It might inspire you to go on and do more things. You just take a picture with your camera, have it put on a canvas, and paint it in the coloring books. <laughs> Thank you. That's the end of my speech.